What if we had an army of feminist boats? How much social structures are embedded in the code? Wireless was in the air. Architecture is not so clear anymore. We are at Reboot of M um, at the recording studio in Akut in Berlin Mitte today, and uh, we're visiting Diana McCarthy, um, co founder and editor of Reboot FM. And Reboot FM is a free artist radio um, which is streamed online and it's also broadcasted. And we are very interested in your work, Diana, because with your radio program at Reboot FM, you create spaces for people and communities. Um, in which those communities and people are able to share ideas and thoughts and information, different from how we approach this. You don't need to build houses for, for them to meet. The, we as architects always tend to focus on the physical space, and yeah, we would like to learn more about the media space that you created today. Actually, we have a small uh, quote between architecture and the spaces of radio, and it's um, written by Mark Wigley in his book Architecture in the, in the Age of Radio. The nested spaces of radio we inhabit are infinitely more complex than the spaces of buildings. Our bodies still engage with physical objects, even encountering them as a kind of anchor or resistance against all the unseen flows, but the physical environment is much more intimately sensed and engaged by hidden signals, so closely and continuously that it is not an encounter between visible and invisible worlds, but a kind of symbiosis a vibration between object and radiation. The distinction between them is no longer clear, which is to say that architecture is not so clear anymore. So we would like to talk about your experience working in the field of activism and media, working with new technologies and also not so new technologies like radio. You do this particularly as a woman and for communities and groups of people um, who are not necessarily heard in mainstream media. As you told us, you were really active in Budapest in the beginning of the internet. We even programmed the first um, Hungarian website, you told us. One of ten. <laughs> One. <laughs> and you co-founded the Faces mailing list, a network for gender, art and technology. How come you decide to somehow shift to radio after having worked with maybe newer technologies? I think we always said wireless since um, yeah, 1917, mm -hmm, yeah. which was funny mm -hmm. because um, like in Berlin, when I just pointed out the the guy, Torsten, he started this bar called Automaten Bar, which had the first Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. And that was actually just at the same time we started Reboot. Mm -hmm. So, of course, wireless was in the air. <laughs> and then wireless is a kind of another kind of metaphor. And mm -hmm. so I like the way you presented me and the context because there's something funny to think of radio in terms of space, like 90s mm -hmm. cyberspace. Mm -hmm. And I was very active in building up alternative spaces within that. And then, like, within Budapest, but, like, around East and West Europe, mm -hmm. also trying to connect with other, like, spaces and other groups. So creating a space within the Internet to have, like, I don't know, our interesting political island bubbles. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the radio became a way to localize because I think the 90s were so intense. Again, like, space, mm -hmm. workspace in, in Documenta 10. And that was something that was mostly organized by Pitt Schultz and Herr Lovink. They are sort of the fathers of net time. And I'm the, like, whatever, the woman. <laughs> I was just there. Like, I felt like, yeah, so I was a big part of that. And I was so busy with those, um, that culture. And then, it, like, we started to think that it would be better to sort of localize. And then I moved from Budapest to Berlin in that time. And it was like, okay, how to reclaim a physical space? So that was the first thing. Mm -hmm. And creating another workspace. And like this, one thing was the success and not success of a certain type of culture. And that culminated in this hybrid workspace at Documenta. So then to get real, and I think there was a notion that we had our kind of online tribe. So all these people from everywhere meeting in where, wherever, but never being anywhere specific. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. so that's the thing that was getting boring and then people that were really invested in their local scenes 
stopped being invested in their local scenes because they were so busy being in other places. Mm-hmm. So and then it was like so already in the late nineties, Berlin we started to try to do more things based here and connect those two networks, like social networks here, but also the broader networks. So that started to slowly turn into a radio practice. And then I really have to say that like Pit Schultz and Guido Plonsky, who are the other uh, founders of Reboot, were doing club radio. So we started experimenting with um, what they were doing with broadcasting clubs, like taking club music onto the internet with streams. And then all of these different things, we had a space called Boot Lab, which was a shared, like a, now it's called something like a hacker space. Mm-hmm. But it was already, like we called it Independent Media Lab. That's what everyone called them then, not just us. <laughs> <coughs> and it was already really interdisciplinary. So a lot of like, Natasha Sadirahadjian was there, like also she was one of the founders of that. So we were a space where a lot of different things came together. So graphic designers, filmmakers, artists, we had a, a quite good event space and a big empty room that was the first Reboot FM studio, which was like four times as big as this space. <laughs> Plus next to it, a room where we could have concerts and parties. And then behind that, a gigantic workspace where we all had like different social and working constellations. So, and then basically even the space was already something that people would use for events. So we had all these kind of hackers, which is a very white male scene. Mm-hmm. So that that was getting sort of colliding with different scenes that Kanaka Tak would use the space for rehearsals. Or, for example, Grada Kilomba organized some events with basically sort of Afro-German and black writers living in Berlin, which was also amazing because I think for a lot of the um, white colleagues, the white men, and especially like white, okay, they were mostly white men, to be honest, that were in the space. It was like the first time they were ever the only white people in a room full of black people and especially black people that didn't need their help. So this was something that was, was really, I mean, that was really a kind of unique thing because I think everybody, of course, they, they, without they, without it being tense, like they, they were a little bit like, oh, can we go in? Of course, it's a public event. But it was also like not being, uh, encountering you know, difference in a different way. It was more like encountering similarities and then it was just a really nice event. But all of these different things sort of fed into this culture and we found that the radio would be a good place to amplify all of that mm-hmm. and so like, so this was it was like out of this space we were able to bring together a bunch of different scenes that exist and coexist in Berlin but not, might not necessarily overlap and so like yeah like I mean Seda Gorses was also part of like the scene around Ishoria which also brought in Orient Taxi and we still work with until today so mm-hmm. like these are the things and so that like, we had all of these like weird overlapping scenes that were able to then like be the basis of what could become the radio. And those were the different groups we were already in contact with. So asking like people what it would take for them to listen to the radio and what it would take for them to participate in the radio. Mm-hmm. And so we did a lot of that before we started making the radio. And so this was something that that's, and that's basically the structure that Reboot of M still operates with. Mm-hmm. And it's built out of that, like that social fabric was really, mm-hmm. um, loose but we knit it together and i think it's a it's still a loose weave Mm -hmm. but um it works really well and then we always had this idea that it was a reflection of space and that it was a way to create a shared space in berlin and like that exists in a real sense in the airwaves and it Mm -hmm. you know it really does i mean as as the voices travel or the music travels through the air over the uh, fm frequencies there is an actual electric electronic signal that's pulsating Mm -hmm. through the air it gets it finally reaches your ears, the receiver. So the senders and the you know whatever initiates the sound and the receiver is finally the ear of the person, and that these shared moments that everybody could have together. So, mm-hmm. but and so you couldn't use like another internet technology that you had previously used for this. Yeah, you found that radio was like the appropriate means to to that goal that you just mm-hmm. wanted. Okay, this was an interesting thing, is that because we were so experienced with the internet, we also mm-hmm. built a really good like open source software. We we were one of the first radios to do streaming at the same time and to use what are now called podcasts. Mm-hmm. So inviting people to send us an, an MP3 file or other formats. We had a thing that tested them automatically. and So we were asking people not for one song, but for a one-hour show. Mm-hmm. And so um, for... Like for us, I think one of the things was exactly to go out of already being in contact with the people you know, because even I think it's more, it's way stronger today. It's already the sort of bubble factor that mm. you can connect all of these people through the internet, 
but creating this shared space is something else. And I think this is what social media tries to do, but we really, I think we wanted to burst our own bubbles in a productive way. Mm -hmm. So like these social bubbles and then radio is way more effective. And I mean, a lot of people didn't even have radio. I mean, this is 2003 and four when we were doing this work, people said they didn't even have radios at home anymore. Um, yeah, so they got radios or, or listened on the internet. But some people were like, oh, I have to buy a radio now. And <laughs> it's also this ability that ra with radio, you reach people you didn't know and that you will never know. So like you will never, like we, we reach more people that we, you know, they're not, they don't call German, and especially Germans don't do call-in shows. Uh, statistically in the world compared to everyone else, like even if you have prizes, they don't call. So, and... <laughs> So, I mean, that's, that's, and so it's like you, you, it's an audience that doesn't give a lot of feedback. We do get feedback, but for every feedback we get, we know there are other people listening that just like, I'm, I'm happy that we don't need, we don't need them to do anything. So yeah. just enjoy. <laughs> okay. So you're saying it was basically the most important thing for you was to put this multiplicity of voices out there so, and yeah. have it, have it yes. recognized by mm -hmm. people. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you, uh, in, in the talk that we had before, mm -hmm. um, you said that Reboot is not uh, Reboot FM is not simply a free radio station. Like it's it's different from other pirate stations, for example. That in, and one of the differences is that it's edited. So you, it's not that everyone can send in the podcast or the MP3s, mm -hmm. but you kind of curate a bit what the content will be. Yeah. So, can you tell us a bit about who are the groups um, that are currently maybe using using your platform? And to broadcast their shows, and um, yeah, and what does the curation process look like, just so that we get mm -hmm. an idea? Okay, yeah, I would say it's, we say uh, free artist radio, Freies Kunstradio, and that's really to mark a distinction with the traditional German free radio, which is often very much fr like organized in a basic democratic way. And that was one of the things that when we started, which people asked us not to do, which meant you know that everyone mm -hmm. should everyone should run the radio all together, and that if you make a show, you also have to be one of the studio technicians we found it was like many people rejected that model. Mm -hmm. And when we had meetings that worked along that model, it was really nearly all white men. And they were really like, even if someone else that was not a white man showed up, it was very difficult for them to have a voice within that space, within that meeting space, and within that culture of meeting space, of a plenum. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, right now, what I like is that, for example, we have, um, I think I would go with like Steve Morell, through him or somebody like DJ Officer Officer. They do, they sort of, people that we started working with very early on, over the years they've had a guest or someone will take up a show. So that's like, so Steve Morell still does the zero hour. He's still a figure in the like electro punk sort of scene. So he's very big there and he still DJs and he does a lot of music, but he's also got a second life as a fashion guy, which is mm -hmm. just interesting. I think. There will be a group like The Voices. They work for refugee rights. They were partly a group that was coming into Voices Caravan have been doing refugee rights in Germany, like nationwide, since I think 24 years. So like organized group that looks that fights for refugee rights and empowerment, but also um, to give uh, access to refugees for information that they would need. And we met that group, and then we did some workshops just around open source software in Berlin and stayed in contact. It took about, we didn't, do anything on the radio with the voices until 2009 mm -hmm. and now the voices is doing a really <clears throat> regular show that's often broadcast on other radios as well so the it's called the voices and that's an activist group and it's amazing because like it they've just gotten so good and so for example one of the women who does the show that she's part of the voices um she also then branched out with other colleagues and they do an intersectional feminist show which is called talking feminisms mm -hmm. and so like so there's a kind of it's a little bit organic it's some sometimes we don't have a lot of people that do more than one show mm -hmm. but it's a very different group and it's a different orientation or then like which i love the young communists who do make capitalism history they came out of the student movement and they were organizing a conference called make capitalism history in 2009 and they invited us to uh, present at their conference, but it was just as we were launching another pro a radio, like it was exactly on the same dates that we were launching Herbst Radio. But we met because they had invited so many of our friends, both locally and internationally. So like artists, activists, and it was, we were like, oh, we have to meet. So that, like they became uh, radio makers with us. 
That doesn't really sound like you have a lot of curation process. It's more like the, the you said, it's organically growing. Mm. Yeah. It's like a referral kind of structure, like snowball or how. Yeah, but it's still, yeah, but I would still, it's it's still, I think, um, like, we don't, it is still selected. So it's like, it's, it's more organic because that's what I mean, the social fabric is there. And mm. I think it's built upon, like, the fabrics that were built meant that we're popular enough, like, mm. we're, like, poppy enough. That we are appealing to the crack one, like the Chutin crack one in Kofaram. Like they also, you know, do a show, and that came through another show. Like we are cool enough for them, we are political enough for the young communists, we are open enough for like lots of different types of experimentation. But mainly, it comes through suggestions, and like we get very few requests from random people. We have a few now, and it's like we do our best to sort of balance out the airtime we have with what we have. I think we've always tried to, to keep it to um, groups and artists that are active and have a following in Berlin. I mean, there is, so there's a guideline. We have a sort of guideline and we try to meet that. And then we also can allow some exceptions. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, that's, yeah. It's so curated, it's so, I, selected, but it's also um, nurtured. And like, we are so well grounded within different communities that I think for us, it's more like sometimes we'll reach out to find, um, like we, we, some, we try to take a step back from the program and look at what's missing, like what's going on in the city and what's missing from the program. referred to a movie, Born in Flames, and we've been watching it. <laughs> a great movie. And I think what is interesting in this movie is also that you have different kind of communities, let's say like black feminists, white uh -huh. feminists, uh -huh. and independent radio, and so you see this kind of common cause that brings those people or these women, uh -huh. I would say, together to do radio and yeah. to use those media in order to get their voices heard. We saw some part of it, so like when we watched it, we were like, ah, yeah, makes sense. <laughs> but maybe there was a project we would like to talk about is uh, the Coty FM. Mm -hmm. was actually quite interesting because you've been uh, broadcasting mm -hmm. it from there. And Coty has really become a symbol for local resistance. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe tell us a bit how it started and how your collaboration looked like? Yeah, basically we had a one month temporary uh, broadcast license. So we went on air 24 seven for one month. And that's something you can do that in, in Berlin, you can rent an event frequency. Anyone can do that. Yeah. And then you have to keep a signal on the whole time. And basically, that's something that uh, Pitt Schwartz and Sarah Lane, who was also used to be at Interflux, so, mm -hmm. and she did another, she did her final project, Udika, she built a radio. And so we sort of supported her with that. And then she and Pitt Schwartz came up with the concept for Kati FM. I think I did more of the outreach and then mm -hmm. like bringing Kati Shop bringing in partners like Kati and Co, who we already work with. We Are Born Free, is which does which came out of the Oranienplatz movement. Mm -hmm. It was fantastic because basically the transmitter was actually in the building where Kati shop is, this small venue in Kut, in Kutburg, just off of Kati. And we like we did again we talked with a lot of people directly involved there and we had a lot of different inputs. And Sarah was like West Germany was important. So it was like Uh, Kati and Co, very important. Sutlop, very important. And then um, Itoria, very important. Mm -hmm. So it was like this kind of weird sort of branching out from uh, Kapus Atoll. And it was just one month, but it was really, it, it was, you could hear it. I went one, way, one day to uh, Tegu and I could hear it all the way in the taxi. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so this was, yeah, this was something which it was um, cool. We did a lot of things with Ballhaus Neumann's class. So it was really like we got in all kinds of people to come and make shows. And I think, like, for example, a lot of um, kids were around that came by, and I think it's, it's like, it built up friendships, but connections, and again, it was like, this very, um, very strong materialization in the ether of real life relationships and exchanges. I mean, there were lots of really, like, just um, little interviews with bakers and mm -hmm. all kinds of things. And this was, I think that was, it was really fun. And until today, I see, Kati FM stickers. They were really nice stickers, like s silver and red. And um, the Atlantic, which was one of the refugee ships that had problems in the um, in the Mediterranean, 
had a Cartier, has a Cartier FM sticker on, in their cabin. So, you know, oh, wow, how did, how did it get there? So, yeah, it's really interesting to hear how, like, how the real life resonates in, in media spaces and how you always, you don't separate those. Mm -hmm. like, the networks you build are here to bring people in real life together and mm -hmm. vice versa, right? Um, yeah, we'd be interested in, in this in this media space, cyberspace, mm -hmm. or could, you could also say in the connection to real life. We have found a quote where someone said that you had worked with social media before that term even existed mm -hmm. through your, I guess, mailing list and mm -hmm. bringing, bringing people together in, in like digital forms. So maybe you can tell us something about what was the social aspect of media back then in the 90s when you started using mm -hmm. new technologies. And, and how has the use changed now? Well, how, yeah, how would you describe the situation now? I mean, that's interesting because, like, I can program. I'm terrible. But, like, when I, when I was making websites, it was also just experimenting in the early 90s, like, with Mosaic and, you know, Netscape. And it was really easier and harder. So, like, I had to, I had to use IRIX, which is, like, Unix, which for computer people can be impressive. Like, oh, you know, it's, it's all command line stuff. I could enter commands and get a browser. To, I could make the thing do, I could make the computer do things. I just, I was not very good, but it was, it was fun then. I think once you get into that, you also see how, like once you start working on this level of line command, which is basically how you can tell, how you tell computers what to do, you start to see how much social structures are embedded in the code. Mm -hmm. And that's something, and how much the social thinking gets embedded in what the computer can imagine, like what someone, what a person can imagine the computer can do, mm -hmm. how socially informed that is, and how socially specific that is. So that was one of the things that I could get into touch with, like through Faces. We did a project called Zero. And I think we used, we tried to use a Corbusier quote actually, which is starting again from zero. And that was like, but that was just a, more or less an experiment to work with like the space of muds and moves, but to get in touch with this line command thing, and also because you really see how. Um, but the, the terminology is so socially coded mm -hmm. and that the ways that people think, you can really see, you can see it in the actual code. I mean, sometimes it gets cleaned up. I've worked with Dr. Heidi, like Professor Dr. Heidi Schellhofer, who's in Bremen, because she's one of the, I think, most important thinkers in terms of like co-construction of knowledge and feminist pro like software engineering, feminist software design. And that's where you start to, that's where I would say the social software the social should happen before you plan the software. Once we started to like, okay, come together, happy times, 90s, and then start to see the disparities between who can speak, who can code, who can speak about coding, and, and then start to see how culture plays a role in these things that are, un, until today, like, like controversially understood as objective. And mm -hmm. so the, and it's like, now we, you know, we all kind of are familiar with the term of algorithms, and so on, but that the algorithm, somebody wants the algorithms to collect the data that they collect, and the questions they ask inform what the what the machines can do. So it's like what we can imagine the machines to do. So, of course, for us, it was one thing like faces using the using the media itself to create social spaces and to create an exchange, using it as well to deconstruct what those things were. So the actual technology, even in a, like in a kind of Friedrich Kittler way to be um, aware of the, the hardware, but this relationship between that, the sort of more vaporware at the, uh, the hardware, and then what are the results? So like, you know what I mean? Because there's, okay, there's the hardware, there's the software, but there's what you do with it, and then there's how that's perceived. So all of these different layers of how media is produced and understood, and how like all of, through all of these different lenses of media. And so an understanding how each of these layers has its own complicated relationship with um, society, or, or with social, like with it's social, it's still socially read and informed. Is any of that still existent in how we use the term social media today? Do you think? I, I don't. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's, I think so. But you would then you would kind of have to go into very sort of, I think, quite specialized discourses around, around media, how people perceive things and what they mean. Like Wendy Chun, I think, is doing some work around this. She's an American scholar that's now leading an institute in Canada, and she's just an amazing person, like thinker. 
one of the things is to like basically look at algorithmic society and how that basically informs what we can imagine out of the technologies. If you look at what Cambridge Analytica did, that's where you start to see how much how much even like these sort of innocent spaces of Twitter or these you know whatever self expression spaces, how much they've been manipulated and how deep how deeply well researched that man, the manipulation was. Mm -hmm. So this is something mm -hmm. where I think so there's some more popular awareness of what these social media spaces are, like understanding them as, as less uh, as more conflicted and more uh, defined by outside interest. So it's not about just people collecting your interests and advertising what shoes you like or hair products, but mm -hmm. that they're also gathering information that can be used. And I see this is, I hope, a tendency to understand like that these social softwares are coming out of something that is a motivation behind them. Mm -hmm. but There are lots of different ways of putting social life into, into softwares somehow in the, or, or in, the, in the digital world. There's always this notion of like gaming culture, mm -hmm. which is like completely male dominated, mm -hmm. and still, mm -hmm. and um, might be one of the causes why women were kind of pushed out of technology mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. one half of it is, and they rely on avatars. So why like like you you mm -hmm. you're a different person and mm -hmm. it's totally disconnected from mm -hmm. your life. You mm -hmm. have this avatar mm -hmm. in this digital world. What is what is the feminist version of using? Uh, like cyberspace is that like how would you describe that when you maybe say what con constitutes uh, cyber feminism or like uh -huh. yeah what's the quality of that space when you use it in the feminist way well that's I mean that's very interesting that you bring this up because for example in this like mud and new space which was really text based it was before there were so many graphic interfaces mm -hmm. and that was more line commands where you would you know define spaces and, there, I think that's where people had this sort of like avatar existence that was where they would, you know, I can be an octopus, a purple octopus, whatever, gender free, where you, for example, had like this, on, like an online rape where someone, you know, there, there were all of these things where people could have a totally counter, contrary, parallel existence somewhere on the internet, like in these like chat rooms or in dungeon, like the dun actually multi-user dungeons. And that was something, VNS Matrix, the Australian cyber feminist collective that's uh, coined the term cyber feminism after Donna Haraway's uh, Cyborg Manifesto. Uh, like, I met them in 93 on the internet. Like, but I was, all, no, 94, I was already too late for that mud and new space to be interesting. It was more like the octopus was in the corner talking about taxes <laughs> to somebody. Like, they're, like, you would, because you, you, once you start, once you get in, you can read the description so you see and you can hear it what conversations are public you can see you can read it basically but it was like i didn't i tried to have this sort of interesting offline experience uh, interesting online experience but i was i was too late so mm -hmm. but um but i was i was curious about it but the thing is in spite of this possibility to be something else it was mostly white men performing this in this space maybe that's what's interesting is that's where cyberspace got this idea of being a liberational space is because it had this um base and it had that, a lot of people had that experience, but it was still mostly white Western men. Of course, there are like pockets around the world where it was different, but mostly coming out of California, you know, and that's why you get California ideologies. So like VNS Matrix, when they talk about Big Daddy mainframe, they already came with a feminist critique of not just that moment, but what that moment could mean. And I think, for example, Big Daddy mainframe is still, I think, like now, I think more, a lot of people have heard this, when they might not have any idea that it refers to the VNS, like the Cyber Feminist Manifesto. It, it's a good operational metaphor, that it's something you can imagine what that means, mm -hmm. and it doesn't sound good. I mean, for the Cyber Feminists in the 90s, I think in a lot of ways that was failed, mostly because it was taken up too much in Europe by just artists, and, I, like, and there was too much um, hype. So that it never had a chance to develop into being something like for like for example, hybrid workspace was basically where the old boys network they were invited to do a cyber feminist project. I mean, like Connie uh, Solfrank was one of the people. Vali Georgievich, who's one of the founders of Faces, was also one of the OBN founders. They were invited by basically Herr Lovink to do a cyber feminist project, and he was sort of oh, you guys have to read the cyber feminist manifesto and Donna Haraway, and it's sort of really funny like. Um, 
there was a need for something more edgy than faces to fill up a space within this male culture, even a hybrid workspace. And it's like, it's, I think there's a really nice article on Rizal where Cornelia explains this to Florian Krama. Mm -hmm. so it's like, mm -hmm. But I think, you know, like, <clears throat> like this, how that came about. And then it got really popular, but it didn't do anything. So this has been my problem. Is hard, it was hard to connect it with the practice. Yeah. And I think, like, like, it's different. North Americans, Canadians, like, U.S. Americans and Mexicans tended to use the term cyber feminist to describe women's, like, feminist activists going on the internet. Mm. And this, I was following this a lot for a couple of years to sort of see that they embraced the term, but what they were describing was actually much more activists using the internet. And that's, like, so it, it, the term, and it sounded really good, and it was appealing to young women that didn't like feminism. And per, I'm more keen on the term techno-feminist now, and this is what I'm looking at, is what kinds of practices. I mean, this is what I'm actually starting to look into, is what would that mean, because we need it now. And so, like, what does it mean now to sort of, like, look after Gamergate when women criticize online behavior towards women and, the crit like, critiques of gaming and how you get trolled and really violently and aggressively trolled. And they're quite, like, I think it's a mainstream problem now that, um, like, that sort of, problems on the internet in terms of gender are it's a very mainstream discussion but I still think like popularizing something like feminist coding like best practices best questions I still think there are some people that operate like that but I think they're still few and far between and like for example I will say that reboot FM has a feminist model but it's not a feminist project or it's a fem you know without mm -hmm. it's not a feminist radio but it has a feminist structure and and I think Wendy Chan is looking at this, she would not describe it like this, but looking at what we can do with the algorithms, what are the ways, how can we use the algorithms for feminist ends? Use this, like, we can all use the data, the same types of data Cambridge Analytica collects, it's just ask it different questions. How do you define feminist when you use it this way? Like, I, I wonder, <laughs> okay. because, like, yeah, what's the feminist quality about it? This what makes it feminist. Yeah, well, well, all you have to do is watch Born in Flames. No. <laughs> <laughs> I would go with it's a radical rethinking of how we like address the conditions in which we live, understanding that through the lens of like race, class, and gender, and how those things intersect, and then understanding how that could inform media. And so, for example, mm -hmm. like on in Born in Flames, you have all of these different types of media, and you see them being produced getting discussed, you know, the, the state magazine, the radio mm -hmm. shows, how you, and how those things are then amplified. You see people watching, people producing. So this is something like taking those questions on board. Let's say I want to build a robot, okay? I want to build an, a bot on the internet. What, do, what should this bot do? For one thing, I would talk to different groups, perhaps Heart of Code, the um, feminist hacker space in Berlin. Mm -hmm. I would ask them, what do you think? I would reach out to people that I think are asking questions, ask them what they think, and through that find other people asking questions, and then start to model that. What, like, would we need one? What should it do? Who would use it? Ask people that I think would use this robot. Like, could you use a feminist robot? What if we had an army of feminist bots? It's just... <laughs> the women's army. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, for example, that if you could sort of subscribe to a service where if you're getting trolled, that, so, that you could have robots show up and help, you know, like anti-troll robots. And that mm -hmm. basically like, what would be, what would be the signal, like the whistle, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and this is something, so like looking and basically one thing is creating a space where people could imagine I can do that. If I need a feminist robot, I can get one. Like if I need, if I need my, army of, if I need my feminist army bots, like, mm -hmm. okay, let's do this. So first of all, it's having like the imagination to do it. So for me, a feminist project would be to build the space where it's possible to think about it mm -hmm. and then get together the people and the resources to make it happen. But to ask a bunch of people questions, because this is, for me, this is the most important thing is creating a space where there's not so much a user or developer but a space where a bunch of different interests can collide productively and out of that you produce something. Feminist software design, I think that's one of the things is this attempt to like with, to collapse the relationship between user and developer. Like even in open source circles, the programmers will often call the user losers 
And there's still this totally strong dichotomy between who programs and who uses. And I don't think that's radical enough of a shift away from the uh, dichotomy between the commercial, like, uh, commercially produced softwares or proprietary softwares where there's a commercial firm producer and a customer. It would mean exactly to create a culture of software production that allows for this other model, which is where you don't have users and developers, that you understand users as developers. The things that somebody might need are built into the process, but their role is built into the process. Mm -hmm. I just maybe to explain to the people who haven't watched the movie Born and Famous, <laughs> it's, um, I think it's fictional. It's yeah. like 10 years after the so socialist revolution in the US, which is like something uh -huh. that is unimaginable yeah. if you've ever touched yeah. ground in the US. Yes. Yeah, it's like it, just, <laughs> it's it occurs when <laughs> someone says you're a socialist. Also, one of the scenarios is that the, the woman, the woman army, mm -hmm. is, is basically a gang of women that teams up and they run around. If someone is in need of help, they come with the bicycles mm -hmm. and they basically, yeah, they are a gang. Mm -hmm. They protect each other. Yep. Yeah. I mean, this, I have, you know, there's this, it's, I think it's called Girl Gang in LA. Mm -hmm. And there's a bike gang that goes around doing this. They're anti-gentrification activists, I think mostly Chicanas. And they are, mm -hmm. um, they are, of course, I have to say it. It's a, it's a kind of, it is some sort of real life implementation of Born in Flames. And this I love because that's what I mean. It's like to be able to produce that kind of liminal space where people can imagine doing something and then they do it. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's like, that's, and I think that's a feminist media because that film was never intended to provoke that many things. Mm -hmm. And this is where I would say that we need that to happen within the space of technology and within the social space of like neo-fascism. And so this, and this is where feminism is needed. Probably for those who don't know what the face is uh, mailing list was, I just said it was a pragmatic response to the need of a small but growing number of women in media, initiated after a series of discussions that took place on the margins of European media arts and media culture events via emails in bars with the question, where are women? So that wrap up a bit <laughs> what we've been discussing is still running, right? It's um, it's still, uh, I don't know how, yeah, how many people are sub subscribed now. Uh, where it's, is it active? I think I just looked and I think it's 450, which is the most it's ever had. Like it's, I think there's always about another like double number that aren't on the list subscribed that are somehow mm -hmm. in the family that show up at events or that are used to be on it, but don't always resubscribe. It's not a cult. So, um, I mean, that's, that is something I still, I, I'm still for this simple response. It's something, I mean, like, Shuli Chang has organized something at Ars Electronica, and it's, like, NetTime was the, NetTime is a still far more important channel in terms of a discursive space, and it has something like 5,000 members now. Like, I'm not even on it. I still read it, but I don't, hmm. it's not something I need to participate in, and I don't need it in my inbox. So it's more like a journal that I, like, co-founded and like with Pitt and Her I mean Pitt and Herod really ran that that mailing list that space was still useful so it was like there were several different mailing lists at the time mm -hmm. so having one for women just seemed it was such an easy thing to do and it was like the easiest thing we could do based on what we had resource wise time wise you know it didn't cost money to set that up mm -hmm. so it was something easy to do and, and it still it still helps you connect like you said it's like basically also a couch surfing it's yeah. It's, it's a contact sharing, it has all these different layers of, mm -hmm. yeah. of, of women supporting each other, right? Yeah, and I just recently met um, a couple of, like, really much younger women that are on the list, and they didn't, like, we don't, we, we just meet through first names, so we don't come up, but I just mentioned later on, like, oh, you're interested in these things, well, I run this list, and like, oh, in one face, oh, you're Diana, mm -hmm. and it was really interesting, it's like, wow, I didn't know, and it's like, you know, I think it could be more... Yeah. It could be more interesting, it's just, but it's just a millions, but it's still, it's there. Yeah. Meanwhile, that time has a huge crisis there, like only, you know, 50 people post, that's way more than we have posting. But it's like, well, you have 5,000, and they're, you know, it's, they, are, they are having white men problems with um, social dynamics. And that is, it outgrew itself, it became too successful, it became too much of a career springboard, which was very good and useful and necessary. But the pre-publishing channel, this kind of interesting space that it was with meetings and publications, like Net, I'm talking about NetTime, which is a different mailing list, that had a time, but that was also very specific to the 90s and early 2000s. And that, like, 
in a way, I don't expect something to function in the same way. You know, and that's something that Faces, like Faces is much weaker because of Facebook. A lot of people would have earlier discussed things on Faces and now it goes over Facebook. Mm -hmm. so. You have talked a lot about how you bring together people and create spaces for them, and that's really great. Um, we would be interested in how you found the place, like, and how you found people to work with and create your own thinking. We we find there is a loose connection to the quote of that we also have used as a starting point in some way for the podcast. Well, one of the influences, um, the quote by Virginia Woolf, or the idea, like, from the book A Room for One's Own, that every woman needs money and a room for her own, yeah. basically see it a bit freely if she is to be working um, create creatively in a, in a free way mm -hmm. those benefits of like personal freedoms and having the resources to support yourself that doesn't just apply to women that basically mm -hmm. applies to everyone mm -hmm. all kinds of different people how did you manage to 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 become who you are and how you <laughs> how did you find out how you wanted to work and with whom and what spaces did you Touch along the way. Who did you meet? Yeah. No. Is this <laughs> well, easy question? Like you, you <laughs> originally from Albuquerque, from San, from yeah. um, New Mexico, right? Yeah. It's far away. Yes, it's yeah, it's far away from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think for me, it was good to be raised in a really provincial space. You know, I'm 51, and it's like I grew up, and I don't like to say it because I like I don't. I like for people not to know. I don't care, but um, I don't care that much. I, I color my hair, so um, <laughs> I grew. The thing is, I like went into the world in a very in a in a moment of political like conflict, and I don't like. Sometimes I was just thinking there was a like in seventy eight this uh, march to Washington with a bunch of like a bunch of different tribes. I remember when that happened, when there were like I went to school in a small town in Farmington. Where there were a lot of um, like it's like on the edge of the reservation, so there were a lot of Navajo kids at my school that didn't live in the city but on the reservation, and so it was like there were bomb threats at my school in protest of different dam projects. So it's like there was Tierra Maria, there was armed conflict, almost a civil war in the northern in northern New Mexico, and like like those things were part of my world, and it was like I think being just privileged enough. And underprivileged enough, so to know that you want more, but you have something, and there's something more to fight for. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, is like I would go with something like this. And growing up in a place where decency is normal, <laughs> which I think means how poor people are with each other, because like until today, New Mexico is a really open-minded place. It's not tolerant. It's just decent. And there, it's like if your car breaks down, people help you. There were some, you know, really heavy political struggles there as when I was a child. So I didn't really understand what those were, but I think, yeah, like my father was a criminal lawyer, quite like well-known criminal justice lawyer, and my mom was just a really nice lady that worked at the like unemployment office and got demoted actually when she shouldn't have. So she broke into the into uh, not breaking, and she broke into the headquarters of Intel. She went in without an appointment and forced her way into the boss's office to convince him to give jobs to New Mexicans as a part of her job. Like, she just refused to leave. And so when I say broke in, she did not, she just did that in a very legal, gentle, nice lady way. So, but um, those are things where, like, being convinced that a firm like that should actually have some decent, well-paid jobs for New Mexicans that aren't just janitors. Like, my one of my neighbors was a janitor at Intel in Albuquerque. Like that, and that was a really good job. So I think once you deal with a certain kind of poverty, and then if you have enough, like a certain like a richness in imagination, then you can start to think differently. So this is something where I would like, treasure mother, grandma, that so it's go out and be in the world, and that I had the means to do that. But it wasn't. It's not. It's not about economy in that sense because everybody could, like I could work three jobs, save money, and come to Europe. But I also had the idea that I could do that. Mm -hmm. And that was that was my wealth because that's not an idea that everyone in Albuquerque can have. Like most people there, just like you can't even go. To, no one wants to go to Texas, but I mean, like to, you know, to even to go to New York is already out of the realm of an imagination. And so that's when going to college, all of these things. So I think one thing is having been the good fortune to have enough on that, like inputs that gave me an imagination that I could do something else and that I could be in the world, and that I have a right to be in the world. So. That's thanks. Well, that's a very like, and that's I think that being curious, a little bit angry, like 
like angry that the world is not right, being curious, being open, and having a lot of good luck, and working very hard, and actually like being way too tolerant towards a very, very low economic existence, like very poverty-stricken existence. But I do, yeah, so that's, so... I would I would change that I would have I would have been more um, like if I would go like if I look at the like the years all the different projects I've done and people I've worked with I'm pretty much satisfied lots of mistakes but the biggest mistake was undervaluing my own work economically and that I should have always asked for more money and every young woman should do that or old woman everyone that's what I would say so mm -hmm. because that's what and that's one of the things I think that would be part of my um, army of robots. <laughs> I hope they become bank robbers. <laughs> so that's like making making being more equitable with how we deal with like resources in time, but also economically making sure that we take care of ourselves in order to keep up the struggles and, and to keep our lives maintained and interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope that because otherwise I would go like I would go on a million different tra trajectories and stories, and I don't know like. <laughs> no, that's a good answer. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the like, talk. Thank you. So, I want to make a small blurb because I, I should be like I should be kind of correct about the radio. Reboot FM broadcasts on eighty eight point four in Berlin and ninety point seven in Potsdam. Mm -hmm. We do this with a license that we've been fighting for since almost two thousand four. So the city has allowed uh, for a free artist license. It's just Friday, Saturday, Sundays, and we have the partners: Cashmere Radio, We Are Born Free Empowerment Radio, Savvy Funk. Um, BLN FM and Mobile Radio, and we operate through a, like a new foundation called um, the Radio Network Berlin. And this, I think, is very important mm. because that's like without this constellation, this would, none of it would work. But it's also wonderful to see that pay off. So it's only three days a week, but it's our own license. Mm. And I also have to say that the Reboot FM team is really fantastic. If we have a unique situation at the moment that we actually have fewer women on the team running the radio than men and that means we have an extra male person in the studio so almost since 2009 Noemi Kairon has joined Tip Schultz and Guido Plonsky and myself running the radio and she's become she's basically our studio freak that's how we like her that's her chosen term to, de to describe her role as studio leader so mm -hmm. and and now toward and we have really had almost always more women running the radio Elizabeth Enka Salome Gesh, uh, Winnie Simon. So we have, it's really unique. Like, oh, mm -hmm. we've got guys. Oh, guys can also work in the studio, don't you think? <laughs> like, yeah, I think he can run the mixer. <laughs> and of, yeah, Andras, like we had a friend from Budapest, from Tilo Radio, had joined us. So we actually have, yeah, we are now like in the studio more men than women. And that's, but that's really new. So, mm -hmm. and Snowami Kairon is still our studio leader. Yeah. And yeah, we mentioned it before very shortly that we are at Akut. In, in Berlin Mitte, yeah. oh, yes, yes, which is this large, um, kind of non-commercially run. I think it's one of it's one of the wonderful things that has been an independent space in Berlin. Mm -hmm. It's always got fantastic programs, and everyone should support it. And, yeah. <laughs> so, how can we support it? Come to the events. Check out what's going on here. Come down, have a drink. Go to the exhibitions. Come to see the concerts. Go to the cinema. Go see a theater. This was the F Podcast and we are the Femark Collective.